Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the McGowan Theater, located in the National Archives Building in Washington, D.C. I'm Doug Swanson, Visitor Services Manager for the National Archives Museum, as well as the uh, producer for the Noontime Lecture Series. Before we begin today's program, I'd just like to mention some other programs that will be taking place at this location in the near future. On Tuesday, March 13th, Professor Jessica Zapparo will be on hand to discuss her latest book, This Grand Experiment, When Women Entered the Federal Workforce in Civil War Era Washington, D.C. On Wednesday, March 14th, Professor Richard Sila will present a noon author talk on his new book, Alexander Hamilton on Finance, Credit, and Debt, in which he recognizes Hamilton's influence in establishing a financial revolution that still impacts the modern economic system we use today. To find out more about these or other programs and our exhibits, please visit our website at www.archives.gov calendar. You'll also find some printed materials about upcoming programs in the theater lobby. Our topic for today is the first in a series of Women's History Month programs, First Ladies of the Republic, Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, Dolly Madison, and the creation of an iconic American role by Jeannie Abrams. Dr. Abrams received her PhD in American history with a specialization in archival management from the University of Colorado at Boulder and has been a member of the faculty at the University of Denver since 1983. In 2006, she was promoted to full, pro full professor. She al has also served as the longtime director of the Rocky Mountain Jewish Historical Society and Beck Archives, which is part of the Center for Judaic Studies and the University of Denver Libraries. She is well known locally and nationally for her expertise in medical, early American, and American Jewish history. Dr. Abrams is the author of five books, which includes Revolutionary Medicine, America's Founding Mothers and Fathers in Sickness and in Health, which examines the lives of our founding families through the lens of personal encounters with illness and 18th century medicine, and which was named one of the top books for docs by Medscape in 2013. She's also the author of numerous, numerous articles and essays in academic and popular journals and magazines. In 2016, she received the University of Denver's Lecturer Award for her outstanding scholarship and research which is the school's highest award in that area. Please join me in welcoming Jeannie Abrams to the National Archives. Hello. I really feel, first of all, Doug, thank you for that lovely introduction. I feel honored to join you here today to share the story of the creation of the pivotal but often undervalued position of First Lady of the United States. By training, I am both an historian and an archivist, so speaking at the National Archives is a very special occasion for me. I fell in love with primary sources many years ago as a college freshman, and it is a love affair that has endured until this day. We all understand that primary sources are the lifeblood of historical inquiry, so the National Archives serves as, serves as a rare treasure indeed. The creation of the United States after the American Revolution was, in essence, a grand experiment, one which transformed the country from a colonial outpost to an independent nation. Abigail Adams later reflected on that historic transformation when she remarked to a friend in 1800, I have lived to witness changes such as I could never have imagined. My new book, First Ladies of the Republic, examines one of those momentous changes, the creation of the role of First Lady through the efforts of Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, and Dolly Madison. Because of time constraints, I will focus on, the three, on three specific points in my presentation. First, these three spirited first first ladies, who in their time could not even vote or hold office, exercised intelligence and initiative to trans transcend boundaries between the public and private arenas, the private sphere of family and local community and the wider public arena of politics. Secondly, the lives of these three extraordinary women intersected on many occasions. And they learned from one another 
um, from one another as the brand new position of First Lady evolved. Finally, despite the constraints on even elite women in their day, rather than looking at the male and female socio-political roles of the era as a reflection of a binary divide, I believe it is more useful to view the way in which they operated together with their husbands as members of a family unit. They each viewed themselves as full partners with their presidential husbands, albeit with different roles to play. And to varying degrees, Martha, Abigail, and Dally all played a substantial part in the nation's early political life. Before we begin exploring the creation of that pioneering position of First Lady in more detail, I'd like to take a few moments to step back and um, take a brief look at how heads of government conducted themselves in Europe at the time in contrast to what unfolded in the newly minted United States. When George Washington was inaugurated as the first president of the United States on April 30th, 1789, King George III and Queen Charlotte occupied the throne in Great Britain. Queen Charlotte had been raised as a princess in a small German duchy, and the proposed royal union was cemented only after intense secret negotiations. Charlotte met her future husband just hours before their evening wedding at the Chapel Royal in St. James's Palace in London on September 8, 1761, and she spoke no English at the time. The English-born George was the heir to the Hanoverian royal line. In contrast, the other George, the other George's wife, Martha, was still in Virginia at their Mount Vernon plantation home at the time of his far less ostentatious first term inauguration when Washington took the oath of office on the balcony of Federal Hall in New York on April 30th, 1789. It was witnessed by members of Congress, marked by the ringing of church bells, and then shared enthusiastically by a crowd of ordinary citizens who had stood respectfully outside the building. President Washington wore a simple but well-made brown suit of American broadcloth woven at the Harvard wool Woolen Mills in Connecticut. The buttons on the suit featured carved eagles, the symbol of the fledgling republic, and Washington's choice of dress was consciously made to reflect that he was a man of the people. Although the Washingtons had never traveled to England, in his younger years, one of George's highest aspirations had been to become a respected Englishman, one who reflected British values and displayed unwavering loyalty to the crown. Washington had always been an avid reader, and as a young man, he had undoubtedly perused popular accounts about King George's coronation. So he was very likely familiar with the rituals surrounding European royalty. And at his election as president, Washington had a new vice president, John Adams, at his side. Adams had experienced firsthand the European courts earlier in the late 1770s and 80s as a United States emissary first to France and then later to the English court of St. James before returning back to America in 1788. When Martha Washington joined, later joined the newly elected American president in May 1789 in the nation's first capable, cap, I'm going to say that right, capital of New York City, a month after her husband's inauguration. She arrived in an elegantly simple gown sewn from material made in America rather than a more fashionable European import. It was clearly a symbolic gesture made to convey the egalitarian underpinnings of the new nation. As the Gazette, a Federalist newspaper approvingly noted, she was clothed in the manufacture of our country. The glittering canopy at Queen Charlotte's coronation was sewn of cloth of gold. As the original First Lady of the United States, as the position would become known, 
Martha Washington had to create her new quasi-official role from whole cloth. Despite the fact that it was not an elected position, Martha, as well as her two successors, First Ladies Abigail Adams and Dolly Madison, would all come to symbolize the heart and character of their husband's administrations. Never officially authorized, nevertheless, the position became highly influential in American history. Without a roadmap to follow, these three women were responsible for essentially creating the role of First Lady. To do so, they often had to walk a social and political tightrope. None of the three could simply imitate the role of European queens, but instead had to construct a role that was uniquely American in both style and substance. As the partner of the young nation's leading political figure, the president, each of them shaped the role of first lady by placing their own imprint upon the position, and at the same time, they learned from one another as they sought a path that would blend their roles as women, wives, mothers, and public figures. Again, with no precedent to follow, Martha, Abigail, and Dolly began to de develop the position of the president's spouse, often consciously working to make it distinct from that of consorts in the European courts and aligning it more closely with emerging Republican ideals for presidential behavior. As I mentioned above, it is probably most fruitful to look at the key players in the new American political order after the American Revolution as family cohorts rather than as individuals. Certainly in the case of the Washingtons, the Adamses, and the Madisons, they operated more visibly as a partnership rather than a simple male-female division. Martha, Abigail, and Dolly view themselves as wives of prominent leaders of the new American governing class with an important part to play. And they astutely understood that it was through their do traditional domestic roles that they acquired access to the public sphere as members of the political social elite. The three first ladies stood at the center of America's political world through their husbands. That was the reality of their time, but that does not mean that they did not possess significant influence. When Martha Dandridge was born in Virginia in 1731, no one could have imagined that in little more than half a century, she would become known as Lady Washington, the wife of the first president of the United States, and a central figure in the momentous events that occurred in revolutionary America and the New Republic. At the time of Martha's birth, Virginia was a loyal American colony in the far-flung British Empire. English monarchs of royal blood ascended to the throne through the long historical tradition of divine right, and commoners, even wealthy ones, would no more have aspired to become heads of countries than to have contemplated flying to the moon. Yet the revolution had politicized many American men and women. As John Adams observed many years later in 1807 to his friend, the Boston writer Mercy Warner, quote, was not every fireside indeed a theater of politics? The government of the new United States was created on a virtually blank slate. As the fledgling nation's original first lady, Martha Washington would have to craft a new role albeit with strong direction, sometimes unwelcome, from the president and un other members of his administration. And she certainly understood that her activities would serve as a precedent for her successors to follow. Martha undertook her position reluctantly, as she notoriously disliked being the public eye, which she found constraining. She also confided to her, neighbor, her nephew that she was saddened by her husband's election and claimed that at the age, the old age of 57, it was, quote, much too late for George to go into public life again. 
for she had hoped that they would remain at Mount Vernon in what she termed solitude and tranquility. And indeed, after she joined the president in New York, she once famously declared herself a state prisoner. Um, I don't think it's just, of course, um, first ladies. Many presidents have felt the same. Truman famously um, referred to the White House as the great white prison, so um, not unusual. But she proceeded thoughtfully and mindfully, carefully weighing her actions and taking pride in successfully fulfilling her responsibilities. And far from being apolitical, as she has often been portrayed, she soon became a very fervent Federalist and one of the New Republic's most faithful citizens. Just two years into her husband's first administration, she wrote a friend proudly that, quote, I think our country, the United States, affords everything that can give pleasure or satisfaction to a rational mind. Although Martha's contemporaries recognized the critical role she played in her famous husband's success, and she commanded great, um, great respect during her lifetime, especially among Washington's troops, who referred to her admiringly as Lady Washington. Today, the stereotypical portrait of Martha often portrays her as a charming but reticent woman. woman. In many accounts of their lives, Martha emerges primarily as the faithful wife who stood loyally but somewhat meekly by George Washington's side, attending to his personal needs and supervising mundane social events. During the time, he was viewed as the most famous and revered American of his time. Yet on many levels, Martha was central to Washington's military and political success. Born into a modestly prosperous planter family, Martha was raised from a young age to be an efficient and capable household manager, a responsible member of the larger community, and a welcoming and congenial hostess who knew how to make guests feel comfortable, as well as being a dutiful wife and mother. Martha's early training and life experience provided her with the skills to later succeed as America's founding first lady. Moreover, the wealth that she inherited from her first husband, Daniel Custis, allowed George Washington to realize many of his ambitious economic, social, and political goals, such as acquiring more land, and becoming a leading member of the Virginia and general wider colonial society, which ultimately led to his political prominence. In reality, it was Martha Washington and not the highly sociable and charming third first lady, Dolly Madison, as many people assume, who launched the first major event for the Republican court, as it came to be known, the popular drawing room, which served a political as well as a social purpose. Those events were supervised and guided by Martha and other elite women who really lived alongside power and were drawn into the political sphere through their husbands, fathers, and brothers. For those early members um, of America's governing elite, the women, political life was often a joint cooperative undertaking, an effort in which they participated actively as part of a close-knit family circle. The drawing rooms and the attendant levies and other and dinners played a critical role in defining an appropriate style of manners for the new federal government. And it one which helped to distinguish itself from the old world courts in Europe. Although these American salons reflected some degree of uh, protocol, including prescribed seating arrangements, they were far more open and fluid than that in the European courts. A good deal of political power broking um, occurred there, including arrangements for strategic marriages. And as recent scholars have shown, the American salons were more politically intentional than French salons, which were fundamentally social in nature. Probably influenced by a combination of her own personal preferences and her new friend, Abigail Adams, as well as her desire to deflect criticism away from her husband, George, who increasingly came under attack from the Republican Party press for allegedly mimicking kingly behavior, 
Martha Washington adopted a more austere style than had been exhibit exhibited by European heads of state. It was one which attempted to reflect the dignity of those courts melded with the new Republican ideals of individual liberty which had fostered the nascent American nation. Elite women like Martha and Abigail, who had access to power in the early Republic, helped mold a new ceremonial protocol. None of the three first ladies became policy makers, but they were still able to exercise considerable political cultural influence through today what we would consider unconventional means. They mustered behind the scenes support for their husbands, their presidential husbands, sometimes exercised the power of patronage and facilitating appointments for family friends and family members, and often even lobbied politicians for support of causes they believed in. For example, Martha's appreciation for the sacrifice that the American soldiers had made during the revolution propelled her to make one of her few overt political gestures when she later asked Congress to provide, veteran, uh, provide benefits for war veterans. When Abigail later became the second first lady in 1797, she expanded the model created by Martha to support her husband John's administration. Abigail had witnessed the British royal version firsthand when she was in England years earlier in 1785 when John served as the American minister to Great Britain. She had met both George III and Queen Charlotte at the court of St. James and had found the two monarchs polite and civil but uninspiring and England decidedly lacking in what she considered superior American virtues, a broader in individual liberty and widespread prosperity. Moreover, Abigail had looked with disdain upon the drawn out intricate rituals that surrounded the London court where visitors at the Queen's carefully orchestrated drawing rooms often had to wait for hours before the royal couple briefly greeted them, greeted the guests, and exchanged social small talk. Abigail des uh, described her first visit to the English court to her sister back in America, noting that after meeting the King, and I'm quoting her now, it was more than two hours after this before it came my turn to be presented to the Queen. The circle was so large that the company was four hours standing. The manner in which they make their tour around the room is first the queen, the lady in waiting behind her holding up her train, next to her the princess royal, after her princess Augusta, and their lady in waiting behind them. The princesses were both elaborately dressed in black and silver silk, while the queen was in purple and silver. Clearly through their manner of dress, the royal family exuded their privileged status. Back in America in the late 1790s as the wife of the second president of the United States, it is unsurprising that Abigail often consciously sought to distance her own more inclusive but far less opulent court style from its European counterparts. America's two first ladies, Martha Washington and Abigail Adams, both aspired to create persona that contrasted with a queenly one, but one which still reflected a formal and dignified style that could command respect without the accoutrements of either a crown or a throne. They each incorporated their own distinct elements of prescribed ceremonial protocol at the events they hosted, and their functions were largely aimed at decidedly elite participants. For example, at the Washington's drawing rooms, guests were first formally presented to the president and then to Martha, who was seated on a raised platform, but not a throne, um, before they were allowed to socialize with one another. Ironically and often to their chagrin, all both, although both the first two ladies and the presidential couples intentionally set out to strike just the right tone, between an open ceremonial style and then, then one that reflected status, gravitas, and the dignity of the new government and the authority of the new executive position, 
Political detractors accuse them of trying to bring back monarchical practices that would threaten the fragile democratic republic by reversing the revolutionary era goals of broader egalitarianism. Abigail chafed at any criticism of the Washington ceremonial style, what she insisted always were mere innocent practices. It is important to note that the first ladies and their presidential husbands were sometimes subject to vocal public criticism from the very beginning of the Republic, as rancorous divisions between the new political parties, the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans headed by jo Jefferson um, evolved. As mentioned earlier, both Wa Martha Washington and A uh, Abigail Adams served as apprenticeships, so to speak, before they became first ladies, which provided them with valuable experience that allowed them to play an important role in their husband's political lives. Martha became accustomed to interacting with people of rank. Abigail had served very adeptly as deputy husband when John was away in Philadelphia earlier attending the Con Continental Congress during the Revolutionary War and during the years that John was stationed in Europe. She capably managed the family farm, oversaw the family finances, and even developed a thriving business selling luxury goods that John sent her from Europe. And later, her own stay in France and England broadened her world and deepened her appreciation for the American Republic. As I mentioned, Abigail had the opportunity to view monarchy in France firsthand, and like Martha, she found the European model inferior. To her sister Elizabeth, she once carefully described her view of the key elements in American society, which she, which she felt made it politically and socially superior to what they had ex uh, encountered in both France and England, and I'm quoting. When I reflect upon the advantages which the people possess in America, she observed. The ease with which property is obtained, the plenty which is so equally distributed, the personal liberty and security of life and property, I feel grateful to heaven who, who marked out my lot in that happy land. While Abigail resided in Europe, contemporary political subjects clearly commanded her attention. As her daughter Nabby reported, during their frequent social calls while the family resided in London, Abigail proved a lively and popular conversationalist who visibly relished what her daughter called her dish of politics. She continued her active correspondence there with many relatives back in Boston, including her uncle, Dr. Cotton Tufts. In one late letter, she pointedly said to him, excuse me, my being so busy in politics, I, but I am so connected with them that I cannot avoid being much interested. Indeed, from the earliest days of her marriage, Abigail was part of a political household. Abigail was also exposed to scientific lectures in London. Education for women was one, an area that had long been particularly important to Abigail. And she took the opportunity to praise the superior education of elite women in England, one of the few aspects of English culture that she admired. She commented to a niece um, that she there was exposed to scientific subjects during those lectures and that it was like, quote, going into a beautiful country which I never saw before, a country which our American females are not permitted to visit or inspect. Abigail supervised her own daughter Nabby's broad education, but reflecting the realities of the time, it was their eldest son John Quincy Adams whom both Abigail and John groomed for political greatness. In my examination of the first three ladies of the United States as a group, I found that their lives intersected on numerous occasions and they really influenced one another in the nation's formative years, both directly and indirectly. Indeed, shortly before Abigail stepped into the role of presidential wife and first lady, she wrote to Martha, and she called her her most amiable predecessor. She asked her for advice and guidance. 
From the moment that Abigail Adams met uh, Mrs. Washington, she was drawn to Martha's natural dignity and elegant simplicity, as well as her warm, cheerful personality. And she found the new lady, new first lady, far superior to what she considered the snobbish queen and princesses she had encountered in England. After Martha and Abigail first crossed paths in June of 1789 in New York City, Abigail reported to her sister Mary that, quote, I took the earliest opportunity the morning after my arrival to go and pay my respects to Mrs. Washington. She received me with great ease and politeness. She is plain in her dress, but that plain plainness is the best of every article. Her manners are modest and unassuming, dignified and feminine, not the tincture of hauteur about her, in stark contrast to what she thought about Queen Charlotte. Abigail not only admired Martha, but looked to her as a role model. In early 1797, as Abigail prepared to assume the first ladyship after John's election as the second president of the United States, she wrote a letter to Martha in which she insisted she would have far preferred that Martha had remained in the position. Abigail insisted that the former First Lady's contact, conduct had reflected so exemplary a character as irreproachable, while it cannot fail to excite an emulation in the bosom of your successor. She then implored Martha to give her advice and to communicate to her those rules which you prescribed and practiced as is respected receiving and returning visits, both to strangers and citizens, as it respected invitations of public or private nature. Obviously, Abigail was concerned about following proper social and political protocol, an area in which she felt Martha had excelled. She maintained, and this again quoting, your experience and knowledge must render your advice particularly acceptable to me from a desire to do the right thing and to give occasion to no one. Occasion would be to offense, no offense to anyone. Abigail certainly understood the importance of her new position as First Lady for bolstering support for her husband John, deflecting criticism, and the central role positive social interactions played in developing the political culture of the New Republic. She clearly realized that the President's wife held the unofficial power to help build or sab sabotage vital political alliances. In the early Republic, the relations between the emerging Federalist and Democratic Republican parties were as fractious as today's political fissures. Abigail Adams was undoubtedly the most intellectual of the three first ladies. One political commentator later maintained that, quote, Abigail Adams was unquestionably the most brilliant conversationalist among the ladies of her day and an extremely intelligent and fascinating woman. She possessed a deep grasp of political theory, often used um, her husband, John, um, who realized his wife was an exceptional woman, often used her as a political sounding board. He frequently discussed his political theories with her and enlisted her assistance and feedback um, on drafts of his speeches. And soon after he was elected president, John declared um, quite dramatically, and he could be histrionic at times, um, quote, I never wanted your advice and assistance more in my life. Abigail even ventured into the wider emerging print culture in the United States. She kept a finger on the pulse of the leading newspapers of her days and provided what she called corrections and comments when she felt er uh, editors had erred in their judgment. Before the lecture, I went up briefly to look at the exhibit on the uh, Declaration of Independence, and there was a little section on Abigail Adams, and it emphasized, again, that she was widely quoted during her days as First Lady, and she was able to help shape public opinion, so it was not an insignificant position. Um, Abigail was especially sensitive about editorial criticism of her husband during the presidency, that led her to urge John to support the unwise and ill-fated Alien and Sedition Acts, um, which in the end played a significant role in his defeat for a second term. 
but at the same time, it may also reflect the first instance that a first lady had influence on actual legislation. If Martha Washington launched the first American political salon, Abigail Adams transformed it into an intellectual hub in which she participated fully and could hold her own um, in the most important political conversations of the day. In 1790, the nation's capital was moved temporarily to Philadelphia for an agreed upon 10 year period. At that time, future First Lady Dolly Madison was married to her first husband, rising Philadelphia Quaker attorney, John Todd. Dolly was certainly aware at times as a firsthand observer, or often through newspaper reports and correspondence with family and friends, of the significant public efforts undertaken by both Martha and Abigail when they each respectively resided in Philadelphia during their husband's terms in office. Dolly lived in the city during Washington's presidency, and she became personally involved in the political life of Philadelphia after her second marriage to Congressman James Madison in 1794. James later served as Secretary of State under President Thomas Jefferson, who served two terms beginning in 1801, and it was during that period that Dolly actively became, began building her own robust political, social, and um, power base at the welcoming Madison home on F Street and the nation's permanent capital in Washington, not far from here. At times, she served as Jefferson's unofficial hostess, gaining experience for her own formal stint as First Lady. Clearly, Dolly appreciated Martha and Abigail's earlier efforts to shape their respective courts through the hosting of drawing rooms and salons, for all three women understood the power of those social occasions to inform public manners and to display their presidential husband's characters in the best light, um, and thereby um, even influencing the direction of politics. Although on one level, social events operated as a venue for entertainment, they were fundamentally political in a practical manner for many alliances between politicians were built or broken there. The events also helped smooth over regional and personal fissures in an informal and civil manner, and drawing rooms afforded politicians the opportunity to test their ideas. Yet Dali un undoubtedly found her predecessor's events to have been overly formal and much too um, staid and elitist and limited in reach. In 1809, after her husband's election as president, Dolly adopted her, mo her own more accessible and flamboyant style as first lady, even welcoming the nickname of Queen Dolly as she was dubbed, a title both Martha and Abigail would have very likely disdained. Some prominent Washingtonians like Benjamin Latrobe, Dolly's friend and the architect um, who actually designed the new White House, were not always pleased with the results of Dolly's more open entertainment approach. Although Latrobe observed that Dolly's first drawing room as for First Lady drew a crowd of what he called, quote, respectable people, by the third round it was attracting what he termed, quote, a perfect rabble in, in beards and boots, so a rather elitist himself. It is important to note that Dolly Madison did not create her political public persona as First Lady in a vacuum. She built her enlarged presence as First Lady um, and as what some people have uh, termed a Republican queen on the foundations that Martha and Abigail had initiated. Dolly retained some of the practices, some of their practices, such as their, her predecessor's drawing rooms, and discarded other practices, such as Martha and Abigail remaining uh, seated to be greeted by visitors. For Dolly mingled with guests instead. She found the, the latter useful in her concerted, sincere, but pragmatic campaign to build unity in a nascent republic, which had not yet developed a path for working with competing fragmented political parties and interests. Dolly did not originate the um, position of First Lady, nor, as some writers have suggested, did she introduce the popular custom of hosting drawing rooms or even serving ice cream at those events. 
um, um, and her events, because they were so crowded and popular, were nicknamed squeezes because the crowd was pushed together so um, carefully. Um, from Dowley's 1797 correspondence written over a decade before James became president while um, the two of them were at the Madison Plantation in Montpelier, she, we learned that she actually sought information about Abigail's drawing rooms from a friend of hers. Um, but arguably, Dowley went on to enthusiastically expand the position of first lady in a manner that was at once more visible more intentional and more, quote, what we would consider democratic. Despite some public criticism, it was a role which ultimately earned her the admiration of many of her contemporaries and future generations as one of the most popular and acclaimed of the nation's first ladies. Mrs. Madison moved well beyond cultivating merely a select group of the nation's early elite to include male and female guests from virtually all classes at her social gatherings, although everyone even at the time realized that most real power was in the hands of the governing elite. Her efforts not only aided in promoting national unity in a highly contentious political environment, but also helped the United States move forward as a budding democratic republic, as um, Dowley's preeminent biographer Catherine Algor maintains. Certainly, like Martha Washington and Abigail Adams before her, Dolly served as a model Republican wife, but at the same time, she was able to use that image to her advantage to support her husband James's political goals. Dolly was known for her fondness for French styles, both in furnishings and fashion, but she was even able to use that traditionally feminine era of interest purposely to foster a unique American consciousness. As historian Holly Shulman contends, Mrs. Madison, quote, interpreted European dress, manners, and food through a purely American filter, an approach which melded the Federalist desire for high style and the Republican emphasis on simplicity. During the entire eight years of her husband's administration, Dolly managed to combine a regal presence with a spirit of social inclusiveness and down-to-earth accessibility, which exuded that well-known Southern hospitality. Dolly's influence was recognized not only by um, contemporary female, female social figures, such as her friend Eliza Lee, who pronounced Dolly, quote, peculiarly fitted to the station of First Lady, but also by the prominent male politicians of her time. The eldest son of John and Abigail Adams, John Quincy Adams, then a senator from Massachusetts, observed that Dolly had been overtly involved in political electioneering on behalf of her husband. Senator Mitchell of New York, one of the most astute political observers of the day, dubbed her, quote, the Queen of Hearts and noted Dolly's potential impact on Madison's election against the, his rival, Federalist candidate Charles Pink Pinckney. Uh, Mitchell declared that, quote, the Secretary of State has a wife to aid him in his pretensions, and because of that advantage, Mr. M is going greatly ahead of Pinckney. Pinckney himself was reputed to later had of observed rather ruefully that he was, quote, beaten by Mr. and Mrs. Madison. I might have had a better chance if I had faced Mr. Madison alone. Although she had her critics, some whom considered her both a political meddler and too ostentatiously reminiscent of European queens, Dolly's easy welcoming demeanor and French-inspired fashion style made her popular with many Americans who longed for more elegance in their first lady. Certainly the often sparkly and courtly clothing she donned on social occasions conveyed the importance of her privileged position to the public. Writer Margaret Bayard Smith noted admiringly that at Madison's first inauguration ball, Dolly, quote, looked like a queen, one who exuded dignity and grace. Smith further maintained that, quote, it would be absolutely impossible for anyone to behave with more um, perfect propriety than she did. It seems to me that such manners would dis disarm envy itself and conciliate even enemies. Dolly was able to combine the talents of Martha as a skillful and highly congenial hostess 
with Abigail's keen understanding of politics, fusing both those threads to excel as a, so a social and political force on behalf of her husband, James Madison. Far more than many male politicians of her day, Dolly understood the central importance of compromise, accommodation, and the need to build consensus in a Republican form of government. Dolly became a celebrity even in her own day, widely viewed as a heroine for rescuing documents and wa Washington's portrait, what was actually just a symbolic copy, it turned out to be, um, just before the British set fire to the White House. In essence, Dolly became the nation's symbolic cheerleader during the war, raising public morale with her positive attitude. And even after President Madison died, when Dolly moved back to Washington, she remained an influential figure and entertained politics, uh, politicians who sought her advice. And she really had become, had been the friend or new um, seven presidents, which was quite remarkable. Dolly Madison was only a child in 1776. She may have understood that it was the beginning of a momentous era, but she could not have imagined to what extent the revolution would change her world and the lives of future generations of men and women throughout America. All, for, all three first ladies witnessed really cataclysmic changes during their lifetimes. While some of the founders' outlooks about what constituted the appropriate bonds of marriage, wifely duties, and women's roles may offend modern ears, we need to take a step back and examine their stories in the context of their time. Their experience focuses a lens on the development of the role of the presidential first lady, as it would become known over time, as well as evolving views of marriage and women's place in the new republic. During the presidential years and indeed throughout their marriages, each of the presidential wives developed robust skills as presidential spouses, operating as a part of a tight family union of their own. Perhaps John and Abigail Adams' daughter, Nabby, um, summed it up best when in 1788 she wrote to her brother, John Quincy, that, quote, the happiness of our family, the Adamses, seems to have been so interwoven with the politics of our country as it to be in a great degree dependent upon them. The involvement of Martha, Abigail, and Dolly in the public sphere stemmed from their attachments as the wives of the most prominent political players in the United States. But that does not diminish the importance of their own contributions. Certainly, all three first ladies used their sociopolitical positions to advance the interests of their families, and through their elite places in official society, they helped perpetuate a class of national political leaders. Abigail Adams was not only the mother of a future American president, but politics permeated family discourse. Her daughter, Nabby, became known as what was called a female politician at the time, a politically astute woman, um, as did her daughter-in-law, Louisa Catherine Adams, a highly accomplished woman and future first lady in her own right. A number of both the Madison and Washington's close relatives were either elected politicians or otherwise prominent in political uh, circles. The experiences of our nation's original first ladies demonstrate that the public world of men and the domestic, whim, uh, domestic world of women of their era often intersected and overlapped. They capably managed their complicated households and carried out the normal duties of women of their status, dealt with heartbreaking personal losses of children and other close relatives and life-threatening illnesses, and at the same time, they engaged in the, pub, the political currents of the day. The trio helped develop the temperament and tone as well as political perceptions of their husband's administrations. And whether always consciously or not, as first ladies, Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, and Dolly Madison, each constructed a public identity for themselves. And in the process, they played an influential role in nation building and helped to shape the contours of the future of the new United States of America. Martha, Abigail, and Dolly became political partners and at times their husband's political press agents and worked with facilitating um, relationships with other key politicians for them. 
All three in tandem with their own husbands were motivated in part by their underlying commitment to the public good, but at the same time they desired to advance the personal reputations of their spouses, enlarge the influence of their own family members, and protect their own interests. Moreover, all three first ladies worked alongside their husbands to help create a viable republic as part of a partnership that was certainly political in nature. They could not have realized that in the process, they were also laying the foundations for a broader democratic state that would take shape later in the Jacksonian era of the 1830s and evolve through the 19th century. Without a question, each of them played a critical role in shaping a new American identity at a critical juncture in the birth of the United States Republic. When George and Martha Washington, John and Abigail Adams, and James and Dolly Madison were born, the American colonies were part of the far-flung British Empire, and as historian Ellen Taylor has recently observed, by the mid-1700s, and even on the eve of the Revolution, Americans had, quote, become more British than ever. All three couples originally considered themselves English by birth, culture, and social orientation, and they were unified by their allegiance to Great Britain and the Crown. But from the beginning of their husbands' presidencies, Martha, Abigail, and Dolly had demonstrated their deep commitment to the principles of independence and liberty which had first emerged um, in the revolutionary period and continued to develop in the early national period. The prominent American political families of our modern times, such as the Roosevelts, the Kennedys, the Bushes, and the Clintons, are not a new phenomenon. Family political influence took root at the dawn of our national history, and the story of our initial first ladies provide insight in the nature, into the nature of political power in the early United States, both at the center and at the margins. In each of their own ways, Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, and Dolly Madison succeeded in putting her own distinctive stamp on the role of first lady. That complicated position, pioneered by the trio, often served as a lightning rod, both for real influence as well as controversy, a phenomenon which endures even to the present. Thank you very much, and now we have, I think, a little time for some questions. Any, any questions or comments? Okay. Hello. Our photographer, thank you. Um, the three first ladies, um, we're obviously aware of the gossip that was concerning Sally Hemings, uh, Thomas Jefferson's um, mistress. Had, did they have personal experience with Sally Hemings, and did you ever find any evidence of how they reacted to the stories? Um, the, well, first of all, certainly Martha and um, Dolly were part of slaveholding um, families, so um, they would have not criticized people, and I could never find any evidence that either of them were unhappy about their role as slaveholders. But um, Abigail and John Adams um, were abolitionists. Actually, their son John Quincy was one of the leaders. Um, the only thing that I found really about Abigail was a, re a reference um, to praising her own husband for never having given their family any cause for embarrassment, as um, was the case for his rival um, for the presidency, Thomas Jefferson. So um, the only reference was a little discreet and indirect, but um, it, it was certain that she had at least heard the rumors and um, she was very negative about the possibility of um, Thomas fathering any children outside of his marriage. But you also should know that in Europe in particular, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams and Abigail Adams became fast friends. Um, they were in France together for a while, and um, Thomas Jefferson, who could uh, often have a rather idealized vision of a uh, woman's role in society, greatly admired Abigail and thought she was highly intellectual and a master at uh, managing the family finances. And um, Abigail, in turn, said she would be um, very unhappy to leave France because um, she found that um, Thomas Jefferson was one of the most estimable characters on earth. So she, again, I mentioned to you before, she was highly critical of any critics of um, 
of her husband, and particularly after Thomas Jefferson became a political um, rival, um, she became very angry with him. John and Thomas reconciled in an old age. Abigail never kind of put down um, that, that division, and she um, wrote him politely when he um, had uh, sent her a letter of condolences when her daughter Nabby died of breast cancer, but she never um, took up that close friendship again. So roundabout uh, way of answering your question. Thank you, Dr. Abramson. I look forward to reading your book. Thank you. I, mean, I was wondering um, if there's any, uh, in your research, did you read anything that maybe in Martha's diaries, did she keep diaries about her, her sadness of the loss of her children and perhaps anything about the fact that, I mean, they met when they were 27 years old. She didn't have a child with, with George Washington. And I know that also when you're, we're looking at all of these ladies, they had personal sadnesses. I know we talk of John Quincy um, Adams, and that was great, but what about, what about the other son? I and mean, he suffered so. And what about Dolly Madison's son? Do they, do they talk about that? Is it, those are real, definitely, as, as, a, as a woman and as a mother, I know uh, those would be difficult for any woman. So, so those are all subjects I really um, uh, dealt with much more um, in depth in the previous book, Revolutionary Medicine, the America's Founding Fathers and Mothers in Sickness and in Health. So in terms of Martha, uh, Martha Washington had four children um, with her first husband. All four predeceased her. Um, I found a letter. She, they were all quite stoic. I mean, I, I, one of the points of the other book is not that today Americans don't deal with the health, uh, health issues and sickness and death. Um, obviously, we still do. But not on the very almost daily basis that the founders did. I mean, I think it's incredible they were able to accomplish so much considering what their personal lives were like. But um, I did find a letter from Martha to, her, uh, to a niece when a child of a friend um, passed away, and she said, all parents who have many children um, should expect to lose them. So it was, it was common for their time. Abigail Adams, uh, Abigail and John actually had six children. Only, um, only two survived them. And um, as you I mentioned briefly, Nabby Adams died in her mid-40s of breast cancer. Um, because one of the points of the other book was how different modern medicine is today, there were no there was no anesthesia at the time, no antiseptics. She had a, a mastectomy with only a little laudanum, like getting maybe a shot of whiskey, and endure that, and, and, and uh, ultimately the cancer metastasized, and she died um, really quite painfully. Um, they lost a son, the Adamses, to alcoholism. Um, she had a stillborn baby while um, uh, John was away in Congress, and um, she wrote to tell him the news. Um, one to me, the most poignant letter that I've ever um, read from John Adams, and he was a marvelous um, writer, um, was he wrote her and said something to the effect, I'm paraphrasing, isn't it a wonder how much one can miss um, someone they've never met? And he was referring to the, to the baby. Um, Dolly Madison actually came on the national stage during the um, yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia. Um, in one fell swoop, she lost her beloved first husband, um, uh, their baby, and she was left with only one child. She and Madison never had any children together, and that one child was rather a ne'er-do-well um, young man. Um, the Adamses were similarly challenged, and again, as I said, the Washingtons did not have any children together. They did um, adapt, so to speak, to grandchildren who lived with them, and they were very close with them. So I forgot the original, back to the question, but um, they, they dealt with tremendous personal losses. They were all extremely stoic, and um, they all were um, people of faith, I would say, too, particularly Abigail, and so um, she kind of met every challenge with the feeling. She wrote to, to, I think, a niece saying that she felt that not even, you know, a sparrow falls without God watching over that, so that um, whatever was meant to be was meant to be. Any other questions? Okay, if not, thank you very much for being such an attentive audience.
also for coming out in this cold, rainy weather. Thank you. And just a reminder, there is a book signing taking place one level up in the Archives bookstore. We'll meet you up there in just a few moments. <laughs>